Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's event, Beyond Chatbots, How the U.S.-China Tech Race Will Define AI's Future. My name is Dave Shulman, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, which devises allied solutions to the global challenges posed by China's rise, leveraging the Atlantic Council's work on China across our programs and centers. I'd like to thank the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center, as well as our partners at the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University, for their support in putting together today's programming as part of the Global Tech Security Commission. The Commission is a network of global multi-sector leaders dedicated to creating a tech security strategy that safeguards freedom through the adoption of trusted technology. The Commission zeroes in on forging allied strategies across 12 emerging tech sectors, and of course one of these is artificial intelligence and machine learning. The conversation around generative AI and its key products, such as AI chatbots, has exploded since the release of OpenAI's ChatGPT, with much ink spilled on the potential societal benefits of these tools, such as aiding in medical diagnosis, as well as potential downsides, such as the spread of misinformation. This debate is also taking place in the context of an intensifying and likely protracted strategic competition between the United States and China, in which advantage in critical and emerging technologies will be central and with AI's relevance to innovation, economic growth, and military capability of evident concern. The competition over AI also has massive ethical and governance implications globally. Artificial intelligence is already enabling authoritarian governance around the world. The United States and its allies are competing with China to establish ground rules for AI technologies and viable models of digital governance compatible with democracy and individual rights. Prevailing in this competition will be essential to opposing the spread of digital authoritarianism as the Chinese government advances global efforts to set standards around AI that bolster liberal forces and disadvantage civil society. Today's discussion is thus incredibly timely. In the chatbot domain alone, the competition is intensifying with Chinese tech companies racing to keep up with ChatGPT and other US developed chatbots. 79 organizations in China launched their own large language models in the last three years, and just last week, Baidu, China's largest search engine and one of the world's largest tech companies, pledged to invest $140 million in Chinese generative AI startups, building atop its ErnieBot large language model. And in April, China's internet, internet regulator released an initial proposal for regulating generative AI systems. And to no one's surprise, it was full of provisions intended to benefit China's authoritarian system. So the competition is on. And the question is how the United States and its democratic allies and partners can maintain a firm lead in AI development and global standard setting, while simultaneously grappling with Beijing's exporting of AI technologies and practices that amplify challenges to democratic actors and institutions. These are complex and difficult questions, but we have today an incredible lineup of experts to break down these issues and offer some much needed insight. But before we get to our panel, today we are grateful to have one of the Global Tech Security Commission's honorary co-chairs, Congressman Mike Waltz, joining us to deliver opening remarks and take part in a Q&A with our moderator, Ryan Heath of Axios. It's my honor to introduce the both of them. Congressman Mike Waltz represents Florida's sixth congressional district. Colonel in the National Guard, combat decorated Green Beret, former White House and Pentagon policy advisor and small business owner, Congressman Waltz graduated from the Virginia Military Institute, serving over 24 years in the US Army. He currently serves on the House Select Committee on Intelligence, Armed Services Committee, and Foreign Affairs Committee. And we're incredibly fortunate that Congressman Waltz has just recently joined the Global Tech Security Commission as one of our honorary co-chairs. We're also lucky to have Ryan Heath as our moderator today. Ryan is a Global Tech, tech Correspondent at Axios. After eight years at Politico, where he created the Brussels and Davos Playbooks and Global Insider. Thanks again for joining us today. Congressman Waltz, we will now turn to you for opening remarks, and then Ryan will kick off our moderated discussion. Congressman Waltz, over to you. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, great to be with you. Um, so I'll just dive right in, and then I know we want to get to, to some, some Q&A, but you know, look, as I frame this, and, and I know you're going to have a series of experts on that will probably um, be a much smarter on this and probably, you know, perhaps disagree or correct me on it. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the, the commission and the work that you're doing is Congress needs help uh, on this issue. But at least as I frame it and look at it, you know, there's four key ingredients uh, that to, to feed into the AI yeah, ecosystem, the data, 
the engineering, uh, an aggressive entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, to, to drive that, and then supportive government policy. Uh, and that last piece, obviously, is, is where we come in. Uh, I've had a series of, uh, of meetings. I, I was able to have uh, a very interesting sit down uh, with Elon Musk and with some other key legislators in this um, and folks that are reaching out, particularly from a safety and standards standpoint, that have been very vocal on tapping the brakes uh, and, and really slowing things down before we have full breakout to get some regulatory structure around it. And I don't disagree with them. Uh, I do think this, um, the, the, these breakout moments, for lack of a better term, um, could prove to be very dangerous. I think they could also prove to be very exciting. But in all of those conversations, when you put it in the context of the global competition that we're in, when you put it in the context of the fact that I... Uh, feel strongly that the Chinese Communist Party has entered into a Cold War with the United States and is explicit in its aim to replace the liberal Western-led world order that has been in place since uh, World War II, and that AI could be an incredibly powerful tool for them to achieve that end, um, then it seems to me that tapping the brakes could actually be incredibly dangerous. Uh, I would almost go so far as to say I will take a um, unregulated or less than ideally regulated Western developed AI uh, rather than a Chinese Communist Party techno di dictatorship developed AI that has the potential to dominate uh, both militarily and economically uh, if those are our two bad choices. So. I think any conversation on regulation has to be in the context of that arms race uh, that we're in. Uh, a question I pose to uh, in, in one of these meetings is would they have asked for us to halt our nuclear weapons development in the 1950s and 60s uh, when you have the Soviet Union uh, threatening to race uh, ahead with both a capability and, and a missile gap? So that's the framework with which I look at it. Uh, again, there's a lot of positive, uh, but it, this truly can change the nature of warfare uh, as we know it. And I think the recent reporting on uh, the Air Force war game, which the Air Force has since walked back, but we'll, we'll get to the bottom of what exactly happened in some, some subsequent when I get back to Washington. But for those who didn't follow it, uh, essentially uh, it, some autonomous capabilities, uh, UAVs, uh, were, uh, were essentially scored on how it achieved its mission in taking out enemy assets. Uh, and eventually the AI model learned that the operator, the human operator, was a hindrance to it scoring well enough, so it turned on the human operator. Uh, and when the Air Force then adjusted the model accordingly, then the AI, then the autonomous vehicles turned on the communication tower so that the human operator couldn't tell it yes or no whether it um, whether it could take certain assets out. So I think that's just a kind of a very tangible example of what can happen here. Uh, and then the other one that we're watching very closely is that humans in the loop in any fashion, uh, when we get into cyberspace and other things where speed is absolutely of the essence, will continue um, uh, to prove to be a hindrance will put us at a disadvantage. And a key part of the ethics in AI that we passed in the defense bill is to have a human in the loop. Well, our adversaries, I think, will have no issue with removing humans of the loop if it gives them a critical first mover advantage. So I, you know, I'll stop with that. But the bottom line is I am very grateful for the work that Atlantic Council, the Kroc Institute, the commission is doing. We need help here. Uh, and we need to do it in the context of the fact that we're in a we're in a global arms race with an adversary that, unlike any in American history, has the economic and the military uh, capability to truly supplant and replace us, which, again, is their stated goal. Um, don't don't take that. You know, uh, don't take that as just coming from me. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, David. I'll stop. And and, uh, and I think we'll go to Q&A if that's what you want to do now.
Great. I'll turn it over to Ryan. Great. Ryan, I think you're muted. Go ahead. Thank you for your time, Congressman. Uh, Ryan Heath here from Axios. I'll dive right in. Uh, we've obviously seen Congress and the US government take threats from China more seriously in recent years. But given the real lack of policy and regulation in this space, does that mean AI is essentially now the biggest outstanding unaddressed competitive threat that we have vis-a-vis -vis China? I think it is because it affects all aspects. We see in um, all of our war games, the first shots are fired in cyberspace and in space. Uh, and wherever you have a data advantage and wherever you have a first mover advantage, uh, it really, it truly puts the other side on the back foot from, from a standpoint from which it's almost impossible to recover. So while we will continue to invest in those hard power capabilities, tanks, planes, ships, modernization, uh, re uh, different aspects of our readiness, having them forward and interoperable with our allies uh, to continue from a deterrence model, hopefully to maintain stability in the Western Pacific, uh, the, the, just the scale from which uh, the Chinese Communist Party is gathering data uh, is, is incredibly difficult uh, to compete with. Uh, not only does it have a society without privacy standards um, internally to gather that data for its own internal techno surveillance, uh, but the, the way in which it's deploying hardware around the world almost for free, uh, Huawei and ZTE being the most notorious, uh, to then pull that data kind of back to the mothership. It just goes back to the old, old adage that I've heard from many uh, AI engineers far smarter than me, that they'd rather have a mediocre algorithm with excellent data than the other way around. Um, and so I think we have to, we have some real catch up to, to, to play here. And that's the trick, the fine line we have to walk. How do we do this ethically and responsibly while we have an adversary that just has their foot on the gas? Well, it seems to me that some of this is about working smarter than where you can have the biggest model in the world if it's trained on terrible data it's going to hallucinate if it's a language model it's not necessarily going to give you the accuracy accuracy you need in the battlefield uh, is part of this about just being smarter about how we curate our data instead of trying to win on size when that may not be possible yes no it absolutely is part of it has been getting uh the pentagon getting their act together on uh cloud computing and getting um, you know, I mean, the, the, the Jedi procurement was just a borderline disaster. Um, it was a disaster. I don't even think it was borderline. So, yes, it is. I mean, just understand the scale that we're, that the Pentagon's, you know, dealing with itself. It, it, it's CIO uh, oversees 63 other CIOs of various services uh, and, and independent agencies. Um, you know, it, it's difficult for the Pentagon at any one time to even tell us what's been patched uh, and what, <laughs> how many, how many systems uh, that they have, much less uh, get, it, get it kind of all on the same page. So they have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're pushing them hard from a congressional standpoint. We're trying to give the resources uh, uh, that they need. Um, but I think we also have to recognize that the Chinese Communist Party also has inherent limitations. Um, you know, our strength and our weakness, it's a double edged sword, is that we're open and collaborative, um, which allows that entrepreneurial ecosystem to innovate and to push and to move forward. And when you increasingly on uh, the Chinese Communist Party side uh, have Xi prioritizing security over openness and innovation, and when you know, when you have um, uh, AI entrepreneurs getting literally arrested because you feed something into a model and then it comes out critical of the, uh, of the CCP in any way, I think that could have a real dampening uh, effect on, on, on their development. So we're in totally uncharted territories and we have two completely diametrically different systems uh, trying to drive this forward. And where do you see the balance of risks around cutting off key technologies from China? Obviously, it buys you some time if you are feeling you're behind in a particular niche. Um, it obviously stops them from getting to, to market or to the battlefield with a given innovation. 
But then at the same time, the risk is it just speeds up their native capabilities or ultimately gives them greater capabilities over time. So where do you think we need to have the balance there? Well, look, I mean, this is this is a long conversation all the way, you know, kind of upstream and downstream. I, you know, I give uh, the Biden administration credit for some of its recent export um, uh, restrictions. And I give the, the, the Danish government, uh, the UK government. Uh, also, I give them credit. Look, I think we have to develop this in line with people who share our values. I also give them credit uh, for the recent AUKUS um, uh, you know, bubble that we're trying to create to reduce some of the barriers in data sharing and technology sharing and semiconductor development. I mean, a lot of the focus within AUKUS has been on submarine technology, and that is kind of the holy grail of our Navy. Um, but really that pillar two in terms of the technology sharing, uh, is, is where I think we can make a lot of progress and have mutually reinforcing, um, ecosystems. I'm overusing that term, but, uh, I, I think we have to pull back because at the end of the day, we've seen this time and time again, uh, where our technology is reverse engineered. They stand up an independent entity within China. They state subsidize it which prices us out of the market, and then they begin gobbling up market share and not only creating independence, but creating global dependencies. Uh, and, and that's something that is uh, just fantastically dangerous to our national security. Yeah, and just flagging for the audience, we'll cover some of that in the panel later on. We have experts that have worked across the world that can fill us in more on those dependencies and, and what's next there. Um, we need to out innovate China, but we also need to have more effective regulation than China does. Um, but that could mean a lot of things. So I wanted to sort of get your take there. You spoke about it being a series of bad choices, essentially. Um, but given the potential downsides of some AI development, it's not just a traditional free market question. I wonder how much that scrambles your sort of regular calculations around how a market should operate. Yeah, well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is it is a conundrum. I, I spent uh, several years on our uh, research and technology um, uh, committee on, on science based and technology within the house. And I mean, that's the conundrum. How do we stay open and collaborative as our uh, research centers, as academia, as many of our um, as many of our tech companies have been uh, even our research, our government research labs? How do they stay open and collaborative, but at the same time protect? Uh, what what we're developing. Um, and I just don't see a way forward uh, without decoupling. Uh, because even, I mean, we have, we've had incident after incident where you have the most well-meaning, um, um, collaborative, uh, you know, just wonderful individuals. Uh, but if they are Chinese citizens under Chinese law, they have to provide whatever the government uh, ask them to do so. And we have incident after incident where even if they refuse, their family back home is put under tremendous and often brutal uh, pressure. So it's it's sad. It's unfortunate. I don't mean in any way to seem xenophobic. I think the Chinese people are suffering far more uh, under this techno uh, dictatorship. But at the end of the day, I, I think we have to um, we have to collaborate and innovate uh, within a bubble that's within um, that could be protected and is is um, in line with our values. From a congressional standpoint, I think we need a very small and select uh, committee that spans different jurisdictions. Um, frankly, comprised of members who best understand uh, this. Again, the entire chain, all the way. And from do you mean a special AI committee? Will yes, a special great. AI committee that spans. I think the congressman is muted. Sorry. Yeah, that can, <laughs> that can put the time forward and do the deep dives that are necessary. We're pulled in, uh, you know, a thousand different directions from affordable housing to infrastructure to you name it, but that, that have the background. And we have several members that do, that come from the tech sector uh, and, and, and can spend the time necessary. I think Congress has the ability to muck this up uh, and to screw this up, frankly, 
as much as they do uh, to, to help. So I think we really have to be very careful. Congressman, that's about all the time we have. You've been very generous. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll let you go now and we'll, we'll turn to our panel. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ryan. And, and again, I can't to thank Atlantic Council, the commission, um, uh, the Kroc Institute. I look forward, uh, I think they're about a year in, I look forward to that global tech strategy. This is, this is really an area where, um, where government needs the help of the private sector, I think, to do this right. Uh, and, and where the think tank community uh, can, can step in in some really profound ways. So thank you so much and look forward to working with you going forward. Thanks again, Congressman Waltz. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our panelists and, and get into all of the, the detailed vertical points and horizontal points around uh, how everything uh, is going beyond chatbots in the US-China AI rivalry. Uh, without further ado, then, I'd like you to meet Clon Kitchen, who is non-resident senior fellow at American Enterprise Institute and a former national security advisor to Senator Ben Sass. Welcome, Clon. Thank you for having uh, me. We've got Dalia Peterson, who is research analyst at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, specializing in AI in China, and she's previously worked as a diplomat in Beijing. So we are going to get some great insights there. Hi, Dalia. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Christabel Randolph is Law Fellow at the Center for AI and Digital Policy, and she has extensive experience across Asia and the Middle East and working in international organizations. So we're going to get some very important uh, global perspective there. Hi, Christabel. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everyone. And last but not least, David Spurk is Senior Counselor at Palantir Technologies, and Dave was Department of Defense's first Chief Data Officer and a Deputy Director for Intelligence. Hi, Dave. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Okay. Um, I've got a question. I think it's a bit for Klon and for, for Dahlia, and we'll try and do a lot of that cross-pollination in the discussion, but maybe I'll just turn with the, the simple prompt to you, Klon. Uh, how and why is China using AI for surveillance at the moment? Uh, yeah, so they're using it in every way that they can. Um, obviously, as a government, artificial intelligence offers uh, a great deal of opportunity for Beijing. We've known since 2015, for example, when they put out their Made in China 2025 strategy that artificial intelligence was a critical technology that uh, the Chinese Communist Party sought to have a leadership role in globally. And they've certainly pursued that. I think the best way to understand the, the reasoning behind that is because there's a, a broad recognition. I think they're correct in this recognition that emerging technologies like artificial intelligence are going to be the capabilities that are shaping and defining future economies and societies and certainly even battlefields. But even beyond that, I think the Chinese Communist Party is actually trying to pioneer a, uh, an entirely new model of governance, one that seeks to marry up the, um, the wealth and innovation that comes from a kind of thriving technological um, in, industrial base with the security and stability of totalitarianism. And uh, they understand that technologies like artificial intelligence offer the most likely opportunity to, to blend those two aims. Uh, in one place. And so we see them uh, primarily using those capabilities uh, from a surveillance uh, perspective internally, because the first, second, and third priority of the Chinese Communist Party is their own stability. Uh, this uh, surveillance state applies to uh, ethnic and religious minorities, uh, certainly journalists, uh, certainly foreigners uh, within their borders and the like. Um, but it does extend beyond that um, as uh, they have a kind of surveillance economy. Uh, so um, some of their key uh, domestic technology champions uh, enable uh, the, the technology that is the backbone for their social credit system, for example. This idea that, that your life can be made easier or more difficult inside of China in terms of opportunities or restrictions based upon what type of a citizen you are. So if you're a good citizen, you have more opportunities. If, you have, if you're not a great citizen, according to the CCP, then you'll have fewer opportunities. And the way that they both 
you know, track and understand that, but then also assess that is through technological means like artificial intelligence. So the bottom line there is that the Chinese Communist Party seeks to use technologies like artificial intelligence comprehensively, and that's why it continues to be a totalitarian regime, because they seek total influence and control using capabilities like AI. Thanks, Klon. Um, Dalia, could I get you to pick up on that? Because we've heard from Klon, and we know already that China's using AI capabilities to crack down on dissent and minority populations. So what is that looking like from your perspective? And then how, how can we in democracies take lessons from that? You know, how can the US government and Congress ensure different norms and regulations spread globally? Sure, Ryan, thank you so much. And agree very much with what Klon said about the, the state of Chinese surveillance. Um, there really is no other country in the world that has surveillance as comprehensive as China's and none that uses AI to the, to the same degree there. So since the, the 90s, China has really had several national surveillance programs that they have progressively built on top of each other that surveil the entire population. As Klon said, that includes foreigners, um, but they place an especially strong focus there on what they call focus personnel. So those are the ethnic minorities often overlapping with, as they consider, um, those who may be suspected of, of terrorism, those who petition the government, um, and, and those who are, are mentally ill and have drug history. These are categories that the Chinese government defines as, as people who may be um, risky to, to social stability. Um, and so these, these companies that are active in China, these domestic surveillance giants, they often work directly with the Chinese government, often helping to, do, to draft uh, domestic standards, for example, uh, that directly help with ethnicity detection, for example. There was also a recent report that came out from, from IPVM that highlighted how companies like Dahua, which is the world's second largest surveillance company, uh, how they are active in developing things that can detect protest banners and the Mandarin characters that are on there and directly flag who those protesters are to the police. Uh, so that's those are those are things that uh, Chinese companies are very active in in helping out with. Um, one one point I really want to make clear here though is why China's surveillance system is so much more advanced and comprehensive. Than, than other uh, countries is not only because they have several of these programs, but also because they're increasingly using something called uh, data fusion. So that's taking different data sources and, and merging them together to create these very comprehensive portraits on individuals and track them across all facets of their lives. And so um, that is not a perfect process by any means, but China has had the ambition and is putting in the resources for the last several decades to, to make this a reality. And it is increasingly powered by AI. Um, so to, to get more to your, um, the second part of your question about what we can do about it, one thing that I advocate a lot for in, in my work is um, what concrete technological alternatives can we have here? And one that I, that I put forth the most is privacy preserving computer vision. And so that is where faces are automated. Uh, they're, they're pixelated by, by default. They don't automatically identify everyone in, in mass surveillance systems. And then you can de-anonymize those that you need to pursue for investigative leads. Uh, this is actually something that's already happening to a pretty significant extent in um, the EU, for example, where the, the GDPR has certain requirements that companies have responded to by implementing these systems. And so I think if the U.S. focuses more on that, developing those capabilities domestically and then developing standards for those at international standard setting bodies, I think that focusing on that both domestically and also um, putting that more on the international arena through standards can be very helpful. Yeah, and I really take on board the point that it's the richness of the surveillance that is now possible. You know, like with the internet, we saw, yes, surveillance, but largely censorship um, often um, around the, the great firewall put up by the CCP around China. Now with AI, it just gets so much more detailed and invasive. 
Um, Christabel, if I could bring you in, you've worked across a lot of countries that have signed up to or otherwise engaged in China's various Belt and Road initiatives. So I was wondering, what are the risks that you see there, the dependencies and the, the other linkages that could be problematic as AI gets more integrated into development, into infrastructure, and China sort of spreads its wings and its influence, uh, not just in its near region, but across the world? Um, thanks, Ryan. So if we look at the BRI and the BRF initiatives and how those have progressed, we see the largest investments in Southeast Asia and South Asian countries and Africa, and now growing uh, also in the MENA region, so Middle East and North African regions. And um, at first blush, none of these investments that China is coming forward with will seem like geared towards AI or high technology. But over a period of time, the way the strategy mix has been progressing is we see that every investment um, from China must be accompanied with complementary investments in information and communications technology. And if we look across these markets, we will see that um, Chinese companies like YA and ZTE have driven out uh, previous companies uh, you know, leading uh, innovators like Ericsson from a lot of these markets as well. So backbone infrastructure in BRI countries, um, communications infrastructure is now largely being provided by Chinese companies. What we do see also is from 2022 onwards, um, there's been a strong focus on economic upgradation, which happens to be a real appetite area for these countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa. So it's not just low quality investments in uh, standard manufacturing sectors. The largest investment from 2022 onwards have been in tech deals. And that's where we see actually China's um, influence or the influence and integration of Chinese companies increasing. And one thing I'd like to highlight while we talk about AI and national security is that we should not ignore uh, the integration in financial systems and payment systems. I think if we look at how the geopolitics and geoeconomics has played out after COVID and after the Russian war, we see a lot of countries, um, especially in these regions, now settling uh, global trade payments in yuan or in alternative currencies. And we see a, a growing pattern of de-dollarization. So we have to be conscious that when President Xi also last week uh, spoke about China's national security strategy, it wasn't just technology or AI. It was economy, it was financial and payment systems integration, it was technology and national security as well. So when we look at AI, we shouldn't only look at national security or data interest. We should see how the whole technology strategy is playing out in terms of how it's uh, how the investments in financial uh, markets and financial systems are happening. China is already providing SIPs as an alternative to SWIFT. So what will it look like if the US economy, if dollar reserves are hit in all of these countries and how the, how will that impact America's competitive edge in this global tech race? And in my experience, the biggest risk and something which uh, Klon and Dahlia have already spoken to is the governance risk. So with Chinese investment comes a, a sort of soft power or soft uh, ch approach to the Chinese model of governance. And that's where we really see a weakening of democratic values and processes. And yes, it, it may seem like a double-edged sword, but if we really want to increase collaboration, if the United States wants to increase collaboration and offer a truly viable alternative to this Chinese approach that we see in the Belt and Road Initiative, then focusing on democratic values, on those processes that can facilitate more dialogue and more collaboration really is critical. And how much, just a follow up there, how much does it matter that democracies develop, for example, central bank backed digital currencies or not necessarily off the shelf regulations, but China has been developing these regulatory muscles for six years now. So they mm -hmm. can easily cut and paste and send off a template regulation to any country that they're trying to influence yeah. as countries worry about how to put some framework in place. And if the US doesn't have a similar ability to, to, to export regulation as well as innovation, uh, that, that surely hurts its ability to influence as well. 
Absolutely. And if we look even in the data space, uh, just uh, which is very adjacent to the AI space, we still don't have a federal privacy legislation in the US. And the US has been trying to negotiate, uh, you know, separate deals, data sharing, data flow deals with the CBPR and through its Indo-Pacific strategy. But until and unless we have uh, in the US a uh, a really viable regulatory framework that we that the US can also export to these countries and facilitate the kind of you know whole of government integration that China is trying to promote. You can't do that without sound regulation as well. Yeah. Uh, now, Dave, if I can bring you in, switching a little bit from uh, economic towards the, the military end of these discussions, um, but feel free to bring in any perspective. Um, I want to get your sense on the prospects for generative AI in military settings. Like we know China will try and deploy those uh, innovations, but there are accuracy issues around these large language models that have been trained on the open internet. So where do you see the evolution of the models so that they can be more trusted? And, you know, what are some examples where you're seeing it happening already? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, thanks to the Atlantic Council for putting this on. Um, I'm also dual hat as the AI commissioner for the Global Tech Security Commission. Um, and so I'm going to bring in a lot of the thoughts of the advisory council that we've pulled together um, and, and kind of put together some material that kind of been in on, you know, U.S. strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and, and threats in the context of the competition with China. I think uh, what I'd say initially to the question of, you know, generative AI in the Department of Defense, in the national security sector, is it's already there. It's already being experimented with. It's already being employed. Um, I could go down to, you know, somewhat tactical and operational units that are trying to figure out how it can help optimize, you know, workflows. Um, I can go all the way up to strategic initiatives being led by the CDAO, uh, where Craig Martell himself, the, the uh, DOD's chief digital and artificial intelligence officer, you know, has a, a healthy sense of skepticism on the role of large language models and generative AI in today's context um, in things of such a high consequence as our national security sector. Um, but what I can tell you is, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. Um, now that people have an understanding of the opportunity that this can provide for them to transform working concepts that they have um, to make their workflows both faster and more precise, and I'll get to that in a second, um, I, I think that that we're just going to see them increasingly, you know, being used, and, and we're going to need to put some light guardrails to ensure that we don't slow the creative application of them. Um, by the men and women on the front lines who do have uh, a tremendous task at their at their uh, you know workstations um, that that it, it would it would actually I think be unethical if we don't allow them to use you know artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to be more precise and to be more efficient. Um, as far as you know, I know people talk about hallucination. Um, what I would say is, you know, hallucinations versus uh, confabulation is an interesting um, difference. You know, confabulation is something that we humans do very well. Um, I know we've all, you know, run into that individual that we've asked a question and they gave us a very compelling answer towards. And then we went and we explained it to somebody else and a professor was like, that's absolutely not what's happening. You know, this person knew a little bit and they made up a lot. So humans do this as well. You know, um, I think the opportunity of leveraging, you know, large language models and generative AI um, almost like we used to do with Wikipedia in the beginning, where I have a healthy skepticism for what's there, but at least it gives me a start point, is probably what we're easing our way into in moving these technologies into the military formation. Um, all will improve as we have new models and new cycles and we begin to integrate them and our domain experts begin to better understand back into our very open you know, system. Um, right now, we have a couple of proprietary models that we're really talking about over and over again, but there's an entire open, you know, community that's developing new language, mod large language models, new generative AI capabilities. And, and those are just language models, by the way, correct. is it? Like when you have graph based models, that must be super handy for understanding relationships quickly when you're trying to diffuse a threat or understand where threats are coming from in a military setting. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. That was kind of the as, as uh, the representative was talking, you know, earlier, one of the things that I was thinking about 
was, you know, where we have seen uh, portions of the U.S. military move the most rapidly um, in, from a data maturity standpoint, you know, places where we've seen them bring in modern data management platforms a decade ago and have been working on ontology, have been working, you know, the, the refined data holdings that you can build trustable, testable, repeatable data workflows. That's where we're seeing the fastest movement on not necessarily proprietary large language models or generative AI, but graph models, whatever type of model you want to bring into that environment, you know, the precision because of the guardrails the ontology gives you, the decades old work, you know, we're really seeing them not be quite as confabulating as... Uh, internet that probably only has about 10% accuracy. So I think we're seeing a lot of movements in this place. We're seeing a lot of experimentation. Um, you know, it's uh, it's something that we're also seeing companies begin to form around the concept of precision and trust. You know, companies like Calypso AI, who are measuring the performance of models in a live workflow to tell you where it's performing well, where it's not. I think there's an entire market that's being generated here as well. And we're only going to figure out how to do it by doing it live in our formation. Over. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we've covered a lot of ground there in those opening questions, so I thought it's only fair to let the panelists be able to react to each other before I try and direct the conversation further. Is there anyone that wants to react to what someone else has said um, in, in their opening comments? Ryan, uh, I would actually agree with, with everything that's been said. I think an additional aspect of the national security issue associated with um, artificial intelligence generally and then these large language models or foundation models that hasn't been covered yet that I just wanna highlight is um, the opportunity that they provide us, not just in terms of pure capability, uh, which uh, Dave was, was just kind of pointing to in part, but also the underlying economic advantage that they might enable at a particular moment where uh, the U.S. economy was was really struggling in the tech sector, particularly, and in the wake of Ukraine and other challenges, we've recognized that our defense industrial base simply is not up to speed uh, where we would need to be, particularly in the context of a potential uh, conflict with China. But just since November, with the the rollout of uh, the latest GPT uh, chat capability, we've seen massive economic uptake. And uh, I mean, just just as an example. There was $11 billion invested in AI startups in May alone. And that's up 86% over May in 2022. Um, and, and this is just now that that kind of economic prosperity is going to begin filtering through the broader economy as this technology matures and it's, as it's applied more uh, deeply within different capabilities. And it's, it's both the technology and the economic growth that potentially comes from it that will enable the United States to um, reestablish its economic stability and security and feed um, what it's going to take to rebuild our defense, industrial, and uh, innovation bases. And I just think that's a critical point. It's not the only point in this conversation, but it's a critical point that sometimes is overlooked as we think about all the very real uh, negative challenges that are also accompanying the technology. I'm quite the optimist on that front, Klon, in the sense that I think, and I would love to hear all of your opinions on what we need to do to minimize the social disruption that will come from widespread deployment of AI. But I don't, I don't think there's going to be a destruction of that many jobs. I feel like it's going to be a case of competing with the machines rather than against them. And if we can manage to compete with the machines, that will be very successful in regards to the competitive landscape with China. But then if we m turn in on ourselves about the arrival of the machines, that's when you're stopping able to compete effectively against China. Um, have I got any takers to respond to, to that thought? Oh, I won't respond to that point directly, but one one area that I want to kind of bring the two threads of, of surveillance and then large language models together is large language models and and their new splash onto the to the world stage. It seems like it's a bit more of a nascent area, and this is a little bit still of a um, hypothetical, maybe theoretical possibility. But I could easily see countries like China doing this, and this this does worry me a lot. So, um, with the the diverse capabilities that that large language models have, right, that they could 
theoretically be used to analyze the text communications that uh, what what people are inputting into into chatbots, for example, or you could even go beyond the the text inputs and uh, look at video inputs or sensor data or or audio inputs, and then surveillance operators could use that as a as an assistant tool to to help detect anomalies and things like this. So these are these are again these are theoretical possibilities. I haven't at this exact moment in time seen evidence that China is already doing this, but again, I could easily imagine them doing that, and that worries me because it could supercharge the abilities of of China. Um, and that is um, we doesn't necessarily need to rely on 100% on Western technology for that if they have their own homegrown alternatives for that with the increasingly um, common and uh, high number of, of uh, LLMs that they're developing within China itself. That is a chance to bring in an audience question, which is very adjacent to that. Um, and it's from Chris Byron Harding. And he's asking, uh, or Chris is asking, um, have they read, uh, have the panelists read that China's AI is trained on Chinese language uh, and therefore that potentially limits the diversity of Chinese AI applications because internet uh, is dominated, generally speaking, um, by English language applications, companies, and so on. Um, so, so will China have a difficulty spreading its tools and technologies if all of its models are, are trained on Chinese language, I guess is the question. Now, I'll jump in first there, Ryan. And 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 I think uh I think it would be na naive to think that they're not um you know scooping up uh many of the the models that are being developed in, in the open environment. Um, and recognizing how to tune those for their own unique needs, whether it's surveillance of uh, English, you know, language uh, speaking uh, individuals, um, or, you know, I, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was Delia or Christabel who brought up the fact that it's it's the data fusion and the opportunities of bringing those data sets together um, in the new and unique ways that they could use both of those models, you know, as they start to think about uh, new and unique things with them. I think to the point of we're just kind of at the precipice of the opportunity of using generative AI, you know, is something that, you know, we've yet to really see how creative people can get when they start to ensemble different types of large language models with different types of generative AI with different types of now and newly available data sets. Now that we have both the compute and transport to allow you know, things that would have only been a dream, you know, three to five years ago. So I think we're just getting started here. Um, but I, I don't think that uh, we have an advantage because Chinese models are built uh, around Chinese language. Over. Anyone else want to jump in there? No, we've got another uh, adjacent question from Jean Wu, who's from Amnesty International and is a China fellow there. Um, Jean wants to know uh, whether the panelists are concerned about Huawei's upcoming AI chatbot, Pengu, uh, which is mainly going to serve Chinese government agencies and state-owned enterprises. Um, but, you know, that also means it could further Beijing's ability to commit human rights abuses in Jean's view. I'll, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. That sounds very parallel to uh, the, the risks that I just put forth. I could easily imagine them using that too, especially given that it's for Chinese government clients. It could be very directly used to, to serve those ends. And Huawei would have very little recourse to refuse that. Yeah, and if I could actually take Dahlia and, and Dave's points and braid them in to, together as well by saying that one of my greatest concerns is not so much, I think the underlying kind of pioneering computer science, uh, I think the center of gravity for that is gonna remain in the United States for the foreseeable future. That doesn't mean they're not gonna be very capable. I just, I think that the real bleeding edge stuff is, is gonna come out of the United States, but I think it'll be rapidly adopted um, and it will proliferate quickly uh, to uh, China and to, and to other locations. And my key concern in that regard is the Huawei uh, and ZTE and DJI uh, drone model, where you know if 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 Tencent or Baidu or or some other Chinese um, technology company is able to generate a a strong generative model, and then they subsidize 
uh, the selling of that model into the United States um, economic marketplace, the way they've done other uh, services, if that's not deliberately kind of confronted and suppressed, frankly, then I have every reason to believe that it will gain market share and traction the way these other offerings did until they were confronted. And in the context of uh, generative AI models, that is a they, they are going to offer very real economic advantage to uh, to companies who who adopt them and, and apply them well. And if it is in fact the case that U.S. companies or Western de- democratic companies are going to be adopting and applying uh, Chinese large language models or foundation models, all the same concerns and problems that have accompanied those other Chinese tech companies are going to be coming with it only at a larger scale and at higher cost. Yeah. Brian, I'd just like to jump in here and uh, add to what uh, Claude is saying. I think uh, we're already seeing um, the Biden administration uh, tightening controls on CFIUs to examine the kind of Chinese investment or the links to Chinese equity. But more importantly, this is why um, we should not see the the relationship between regulation and innovation as necessarily a trade-off, because if we're not able to protect the U.S. economy, the U.S. people, the U.S. consumers from these kinds of technologies that may be abusive, that may be misused, then really uh, that's the first failure. Uh, If we look at China's generative AI uh, regulation draft that was released in April, Yes, it talks about promoting uh, the CCP values or in in terms of output, but it also addresses very real issues of mental health. It addresses very real issues about protecting intellectual property rights. Uh, All the kinds of tensions and the discussions and debates that we're seeing in the United States. So I would just like to reiterate that, yes, of course, having the focus in the Biden administration has already uh, you know, announced the OSTP has announced its new strategy um, about investing, increasing federal investment in R&D, in education, but also, uh, you know, now issuing a request for comment on what kind of regulations would most be appropriate to ensure that we have the right guardrails in place. So without the guardrails, we can't protect American people. And I think that should be the focus as well. Yeah, there's one very important feature for anyone listening I wanted to point out about how China's approaching regulation on AI specifically is the trust effects. So if you look at which populations trust AI most around the world, China's right up there. Mm-hmm. And we're about number two, sometimes number three on dis- different aspects. So by developing these regulatory muscles early, they're fostering the sense along with propaganda that AI can be trusted, which helps you build up the data sets, can be used for nefarious purposes. And it's a really different discourse to the US where the debate in the last sort of six to eight weeks has all been around, are we going to become robot slaves? What sort of intense regulation do we need to have, but then not any practical steps for for getting there? Um, and, and I think that's a fairly dangerous situation to be in if you have uh, a Chinese population that's extremely accepting of, of, of AI, then that juices not only a domestic market, but it can juice potential ex- export markets as well. Mm-hmm. And it's really quite distinctive, whatever you think of that characteristic uh, from the situation in, in, in some democracies at the moment. Absolutely. And you, the guardrails that we're talking about or any kind of regulation must be geared towards public trust of American people. Like you said, uh, even the recent Pew research shows that Americans are more apprehensive than enthusiastic about AI. And one of the reasons is because there is uh, a lack of trust in the kind of guardrails around these technologies. Yeah. And if I could, you know, I'm, I'm actually I, I'm going to reference directly one of the uh, threats from the SWOT analysis we did for the Global Tech Commission. Um, and, and, you know, it goes to, to, to the point that you're making, Ryan, and that, that Christabel's making, which is, you know, point number three we have on threat. The Chinese Communist Party wages an information operations campaign against the population of the U.S. and its partners and allies to sow distrust in AI and force the overregulation of data and governance, slowing the adoption, you know, and inclusion of these technologies in both our national security workflows, but also our industrial complex. Um, you know, leveraging um, artificial intelligence, leveraging generative AI, the ability to sow disinformation and misinformation is going to be something that the world's never been confronted with. 
we you know have instances recently where we think we've seen misinformation campaigns <laughs> be it in the public sector be it you know in polling but when we start talking about the full application of these technologies you know um, how we can begin to work with our partners and allies and leverage them to create truth to generate trust to generate um, a knowledge base that people can go to to say that's where real answer is is going to be pretty profound and i think we're probably going to see those countries that don't have our values or those of our allies and partners begin to try and manipulate that space over yeah. So, so Ryan, if I could just add to something very quickly, uh, I completely agree that we need partners and allies uh, synced up very tightly with the American approach and that we need to be thoughtful about that. But I just want to raise one of my key concerns in that regard, and that is that so many of our democratic allies, particularly those uh, in Europe, increasingly seem to have concluded that for them to build up their own technological industrial bases domestically, they have to either constrain or even in some cases decouple from the American technological innovation base. And as we talk about regulation, what we're actually seeing is regulatory schemes come out of the European Union and other locations that actually go in the exact opposite direction of where we're trying to go in terms of building these trusted ecosystems of innovation and development amongst our partners and allies. And that I do believe it's inadvertent, but it's still nevertheless very real in many cases, one, those kind of um, regulate first and, and, and ask questions later strategies are beginning to proliferate beyond Europe into partners and allies in the Asia Pacific uh, area and around the world. And then two, it's, it's actually constraining our ability to do the types of partnerships that are gonna be necessary for our shared long-term thriving. Yeah, I think like this, to some extent that's the platform effect. So I'm, I'm not American, I'm Australian, but I lived in Europe for a long time, including some time working at the EU. And I think when tech was hardware focused, um, we see we see that hardware focused tech is more trusted in general. And it was, you know, less of a problem from a European perspective, talking going back 20, 30 years. And platforms have sort of injected this element of distrust about tech more generally in a lot of markets around the world. Um, it's seen as a particularly American thing. And, uh, you know, it kind of just has spillover effects, whether that's rational or not. And, and then when you have this lack of trust, you're in a really terrible position when things start to become a serious strategic problem vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and, and you're right, there is a big split at the moment. And I think it's going to be quite a hard one to stitch back together. Uh, maybe I can turn to another audience question here. Um, John Jansen from the Virginia State Police, uh, who's a program manager there, asks, should U.S. state legis legislatures enact laws to protect businesses and university uh, from IP theft by nation states such as China or other actors? And if so, what can be accomplished by changing criminal codes to, to 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 tackle IP theft more broadly? No takers on that one. Uh, this week, uh, there is an upcoming um, hearing at the Senate Judiciary Committee on uh, AI and intellectual property. It'll be nice to see or interesting to see what kind of expert views and what direction comes out from there, because there are important implications as far as generative AI and creators and um, IP content is concerned, and also producing IP content, especially since AI is being applied across many industries, also importantly, the pharmaceutical industry. So we will get some direction, hopefully this week from that. And what do you think of the congressman, Congressman Waltz's idea of having a specific AI committee uh, in the House and or Senate? Is that helpful because AI is so transformative and complex? Or is it unhelpful because it shouldn't be siloed and in fact needs to be dealt with and become a core competence of members of Congress, however complicated that may be for them? Yeah, my, my opinion there, Ryan, having worked with the Hill from, from 27 years uh, in, inside the executive branch and, and, and military is, you know, this, this is a commodity. This is, this is a utility. Um, it's applicability across 
you know, all sectors, both commercial, government, academia, um, it, it makes it really hard to, to centralize in any one location. Um, I think I think we probably need to um, have inside each, um, you know, committee um, some improved understanding of data driven technology um, so that the fluency across each legislative committee, you know, has improved and thereby they can think through the application of uh, data-driven technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, but I think centralizing it in one location probably is a mistake. That's my opinion. I'm sure, you know, Claude and others have a different different uh, uh, perspective on it, but that's just mine. I will gladly take other views. Anyone want to jump in? Uh, I have to agree with uh, David. I think this should be a whole of government approach. It can't just sit in any one, one place. And if we look at the kind of statements that are being issued by the federal agency, so we see the Federal Trade Commission, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there was a joint statement issued by the four key federal agencies, uh, DOJ Civil Liberties Division as well. So this just goes to show that you cannot have one committee or one agency dealing with it. Right. Um, one other question I had, and maybe um, Dalia, it's uh, best for you, but anyone feel, please feel free to jump in. Um, we have seen the US has maintained its innovation lead, but there's been a really big uptick in AI talent uh, in China. And one of the indicators there is the quantity and the quality of the research on AI that's coming from Chinese researchers uh, these days. Um, where do you see that headed, Dalia? Is that something that can be converted into um, matching the US on innovation? Or are these researchers going to keep hitting ceilings and walls because they're constantly dealing with security assessments and other forms of censorship as they try and develop their AI? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ryan. So I think on the talent side, I'm, I'm glad that talent has been introduced as a dimension into this conversation because I, I really think it is the key, the, one of the key, if not the absolute most key part of this entire, uh, if we're talking about a US-China tech race, um, talent is the, the most essential ingredient in this. It's, it's something that has been reflected by a recent CSET survey that I'll highlight here of, of AI researchers that found that um, contrary to, to expectations where a lot of uh, folks are talking about compute as the key bottleneck nowadays, it, these um, researchers concluded that it was indeed um, talent. And so I, I think it's really important to pay attention to what China is doing in developing its AI talent pipeline. It has, um, this was something that they put in their national AI development plan uh, in, in 2017. And they have made great strides on that ever since. They have implemented AI education at every level, um, starting very early on in the elementary school level. They've mandated AI curriculum in high schools. Um, they have, and then I, I would say when you move to the undergraduate level, that's where they really take off uh, the, the Ministry of Education. You can't really compare it at all to the US education system, but the Ministry of Education in China standardizes majors and approves them. So they have an actual artificial intelligence major that has existed for the past uh, three or four years. And um, nearly 450 universities offer that major today. And so there is just, um, there, there are some caveats that I want to say there in terms of like, we don't know how well-trained those students are. And we don't know the quantity of people who are graduating with that AI major. Um, but China is really trying to move forward on educating its population um, on the fundamentals of AI from a very early age. I think that is in like really stark contrast to the U.S., where there are some very commendable AI majors and there are some um, at the, the university level. There are um, certain states, I think like Georgia, for example, um, they have um, really great AI curriculum at the high school level. But mostly speaking across the U.S., it's this very piecemeal approach that is still kind of focused on computer science fundamentals without really bringing in the AI layer on top of that. Um, so I think that is a missed opportunity. Um, we do a lot of work at, at CSET to detail those, those differences between the U.S. and China and, and pathways that the U.S. should take to 
focus more of that um, education at a, at a domestic level, I think that would go a long way in helping to um, assist the U.S. in, in keeping that innovation edge. Um, we mm. really need to start focusing on that transition now. And is there a real opportunity for a reset now? Not, not just because we're all thinking and talking about it, but when you go to a low code or no code situation, for example, it seems to me like, in fact, the latest innovations now bring about a whole new set of skills because it's not just people building AI, like the skill set is how do you use it um, to make your job better, not just to predict your job, but ultimately to, to build a stronger national economy. So it feels like just in the last six months, like everything's changed in that respect and that it's a level playing field for anyone who wants to, to set up that element of education. Right. I think like emphasizing to young children um, that there are many different ways to get into the AI field and that um, you don't necessarily have to have the most extraordinarily technical background. You don't have to have a PhD in machine learning, um, although that that definitely helps to have the actual best and brightest pushing the field forward. Um, there there was something that I that I heard recently about how, you know, like, for example, the New York education system is is banning things like chat GPT in schools, while private schools are helping to teach students prompt engineering. Um, so that's that's just like a very big difference. Uh, hopefully that that levels out as public education systems realize that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And it's it's best to help students learn how to work with those environments and um, you know, work with those um, low code and, and no code um, situations to help bring as many people into the potential AI workforce as possible. Yeah, and I should I should note Randy Weingarten, who runs the the biggest national teachers union in the U.S., um, is reasonably supportive of AI. She's not a head in the sand sort of person. She's like, how do we how do we make the most of this and integrate this fairly? Not uh, shut it down, sort of pretend it's not there. Um, so hopefully that's a sign that others will not copy New York um, uh, in, in that. Um, it's now down to the last couple of minutes, so a chance for final thoughts from each of you. Um, maybe I'll go to, to Klon, then Dave, then Christabel. Well, thank you, Ryan, and thank you to the fellow panelists. This is a very encouraging and, and thoughtful conversation. I think um, as, I, as I close the, this idea, about artificial intelligence and its implications for the US-China competition. Uh, I do want to emphasize, because there's plenty of conversation about the very real, scarier, darker sides of all of this, but um, if, if, if you ask me, I'd still much rather be the United States than China navigating these various challenges. No one escapes them. And I think our system, while clunky and perhaps slower in the near term, is actually built to resolve these challenges in ways that are more uh, fair, uh, more resilient, and that ultimately lead to uh, greater human thriving writ large and over the long term. And so when I look at this technology, I think that there are some, some critical moments ahead, but I think um, that my overall take is actually quite optimistic, not, not Pollyannish, but optimistic because of what I see uh, this technology and its kind of attendant capabilities that it's gonna give rise to and their implications for our social, economic, and even our political spheres. Um, so not, not completely uh, all good news, but I think enough good news to give everyone genuine, uh, genuine reason to be optimistic over the long term. Can you keep that ball rolling, Dave, or are you going to spoil the... the oh, I won't, I won't spoil it. I, I agree with, with Klon. You know, real, realistic, but, um, you know, also optimistic. Um, I think U.S. strengths, um, hands down, continue to beat, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the threats uh, posed by, by China to the continued development of responsible AI. Um, I think the U.S. you know has has some crown jewels at its disposal um, in our leading AI companies, um, in our world class academic institution, in the way that those are run and actually feed into that that creative startup ecosystem. 
Um, I think that ecosystem, you know, thrives because of the open and collaborative research culture around, you know, those three things that I already mentioned. And uh, just from the national security perspective, you know, we have field experience in AI application. Um, we do. You know, when I look back to some of the things that we started now six, seven years ago with Project Maven and the DOD, and, you know, we were just trying to see if we could use computer vision in full motion video. And as we started pulling that, we got the uh, domain experts, you know, excited about, hey, if it can do that, can it do this? And that kind of goes all the way back, back to that creativity um, that, that allows our artists and our domain experts to continue bringing new and wild applications of this technology. I think the difference between that and the, the Chinese Communist Party system, not the Chinese people, um, is that they have a very rigid structure. And while, you know, mathematically that makes a lot of sense and it allows you to deliver a certain type of person in a certain type of way for a certain type of product, I think the world's just beginning to understand, you know, fully how we can begin to unlock the value of these um, in the national security sector and just, you know, for humanity writ large. And I think we'll stay ahead as long as we continue to encourage that aspect of it. Over. Thanks, Dave. And now, Christabel, final word on the panel to you. Um, I'd like to conclude with just three frames of reference. One, as we look at this competition or tech race, we must not forget the word collaboration and we must not forget how America or the United States can lead in uh, alliances, can lead in collaboration uh, with not just technology, but economy, with development, with green and clean energy, because it all ties in. And actually, the potentials for AI range across all of these sectors. So it's not just looking at a national security sector or not just education and research, but having a very broad, um, you know, um, overview of the applications and the areas uh, involved. Um, all America's uh, allies also trade with China, all have investments with China, very large investments. So it's not going to be a very binary choice for American allies as well. So let's focus on collaboration and how do we build alliances um, as we try to progress in this competition. Uh, the second uh, frame of reference I will uh, offer is Again, I've said it earlier, we should not see innovation and regulation as a trade-off. If we look at the history of innovation, we've also seen how good regulation has actually spurred uh, innovation, and most importantly, in America. Uh, American history shows that. So, and some of the, uh, you know, issues that uh, Juan was mentioning with Europe and the decoupling with American tech firms, it didn't result because of the technology or the innovation that those firms offered, but the issue surrounding the GDPR and adequacy and all of that was basically that there were no interoperable regulations or no equivalent regulations, so to speak. So I would really come back and say that um, we need to focus on regulation in as much as we focus on technology because they have to speak to each other and they have to speak to the alliances and the collaborative frameworks that uh, the collaborative statecraft that the United States wants to advance. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. That really was a great discussion. Uh, and now it's time for some closing remarks from Michelle Gita, who's the director of the Crack Institute of Tech Diplomacy at Purdue University. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and thank everyone for a great panel today. Um, it feels like the, the overarching sentiment following this discussion is one of, let's say, optimistic realism, uh, which is good. It's a good realism. Um, so anyway, thank you everybody for a very important discussion, a very timely discussion. Uh, and the overall takeaway, as you've heard over the course of the past hour, is that innovation in artificial intelligence is not happening in a vacuum, taking place in a 21st century contest between democracy and authoritarianism, in which technology is the main battlefield and the crossroads of that. So the imperative is really twofold. And that is the imperative that the free world do it first, and do it right when it comes to artificial intelligence. And by doing it first, we mean letting the private sector lead, letting innovators lead, letting academia and R&D lead and move at the speed of innovation. Because we know if we don't develop it uh, first and responsibly, the CCP is going to do it first and irresponsibly. 
And then the second imperative is doing it right. So taking that innovation from the tech sector, from academia and other innovators, and doing it in close collaboration and conversation with policymakers and civil society and all of the important stakeholders. As Christabel was saying, it's not a trade-off. It really is a collaboration between all of these important stakeholder groups. Because at the end of the day, um, as Ryan was saying, AI, it, you know, it's not about tech, it's about trust. And so it means that all of these important groups from innovators to policymakers need to work together to put trust principles at the center of how artificial intelligence is gonna be used. And so uh, in closing, that's what the Global Tech Security Commission is doing. We're bringing tech sector leaders, international leaders and policymakers and, and strategic foreign policy leaders all together to have a really important conversation in clo close collaboration around not only how artificial intelligence is gonna be used, but about how all critical technologies that affect our national security, international security, and ultimately freedom around the world. And so we're proud to do that uh, together with the Global Tech Security Commission. I wanna thank uh, Congressman Mike Waltz earlier uh, for his remarks and for joining us today, Ryan, uh, for moderating this great conversation, Klon, Dahlia, Christabel, Dave, um, really great conversation. Uh, and also wanna thank our partners at the Atlantic Council and Dave Shulman there. Uh, very proud of the work that we're doing at the Global Tech Security Commission, and thank you for a very important conversation today.